I think it's time we stopped our cringing embarrassment about our history, about our traditions and about our culture. And we stop this general bout of self-recrimination and wetness. It's funny how Boris suggests that we should stop talking about our history. Personally, I don't think we've really actually touched the surface of what Britain has done. From being involved in multiple genocides to being one of the biggest drug dealers in history. I'm going to go over this, but I'm also going to link it in with something that Farage and Starkey have also been harping on about as well. Because they too have been talking about how we shouldn't talk about this level of history. And it, in fact, it's a rewrite. As a historian and as someone who's gone through the English history system for school, I find it spellbinding that they say this because when I was at school, when I was a boy, we did not get taught about the genocides that we were involved in or the drug deals that we took part in. And yet there's some of the biggest parts of our history. Now there are obviously other things that we did well. You can talk about the significance of the Industrial Revolution. You can talk about the idea of spreading democracy. Or you could talk about helping Europe on a number of occasions. Stopping tyrants and dictators to completely take over. But we shouldn't also ignore the negatives. And it feels like we do that on a regular basis. So this week, that's what we're going to focus on. And we will not forget Boris's part in history, both in his denial of some of our actions, as well as his involvement in one of the highest death counts in English history. Bear in mind, in a year Boris presided over, more people have died than the Nazis managed to do in five years of bombing us. Have a listen to Boris's denial. Some say it was a snub to Britain. Some say it was a symbol of the part Kenyan president's ancestral dislike of the British Empire. Hey everyone, welcome back to Political X. For more knowledge and updates on UK, European and US politics, make sure you subscribe to this channel. So both of these men and Boris are in complete denial about some of the events that took place. And one of the concerns as a historian to denying this is that it's the truth. That's the first consideration and concern. The second thing is, if you do not reveal what this truth is, how can you move forward? You cannot be in a state of denial. You have to be able to analyze it and recognize what took place. Now, unfortunately for British history, we have a substantial history that involves a number of genocides, some of which are on such a large scale, they are unique in history. So I'm going to go in chronological order and we're just going to go through all of them. Then we're going to have a listen to what David Starkey and Farage say about this history and about this rewriting of history. We start from 1526 and talking about Britain's involvement in the Atlantic slave trade. A trade that went on all the way until the 19th century. It spanned three continents and involved the removal of over 10 million Africans. Slavery had been around for thousands of years, but this form of slavery was unique in the fact that it was determined based on the colour of skin, making it unique in history, as well as the uniqueness of the transatlantic trade. With the majority of the work being done by the Portuguese and the British, and the British being significantly ahead of the Portuguese in the trade. Women, men, children were taken on board ship, they were shaved, they were branded as if they were some form of cattle, stowed on board in conditions which seem very similar to that of the concentration camps. Women were taken on board to be raped, children were exposed to paedophilia, men and women were brutalised and the crews generally filled the ship to the brim. About one third would not make the journey across. This even included the use of sharks as a form of terror which would follow the boats in the hope of getting some poor soul throwing themselves overboard or being thrown overboard. 
this is the biggest forced migration in world history. And Sir Francis Drake and his brother were both involved in this slave trade and they were the first Brits to be involved in the slave trade. Whilst the slave trade was taking place, the British had also moved into North America and the Caribbean, committing a number of genocides, both in what is now known as the United States, Canada, and the Caribbean. On the island of St. Kitts, the Kalango genocide took place where 2,000 of the locals were massacred and the rest were then deported to the island of Dominica. Multiple genocides were either attempted or were successful in the, what is now known as the United States, in King the Picoy, Narragansett, and the Ottawa Indians. In the end, 90% of Native Americans within the United States will be wiped out by the early 1900s. This is all started by the British. What you'll hear in some scholarly arguments is that actually disease was the main cause of this. However, there's very little evidence to back that up. Disease at best would have caused about 30% of the fatalities that took place. However, what we are aware of is disease plus war does create that level. And there is good reason to us to actually justify that. And that's what's taking place in Australia. And we'll look at that in a minute. That's because we still have Canada to talk about. A country that only officially separated in full from the United Kingdom under the Canada Act of 1982. And this is important because we're going to look at the genocide that took place, which started with the taking of Aborigines and putting them in schools and indoctrinating them into Christian and British ways. A toxic legacy that caused unbelievable levels of damage. However, of July of 2021, it's been discovered that the schools that were taking these children to convert them into British and Canadian thinking now have mass graves. Thousands of children have been butchered under the British watch. The next is Australia from 1770 or 1778, depending on when you want to have a start date for colonization, with 90% of the population having been destroyed again there's only one other example of this in human history and that is the americas similar tactics were put into place whether that was germ warfare or assaults on the local tribes or indoctrination and enforcement into schools what becomes particularly shocking as well is what takes place in 1947 which i'm going to talk about a little bit later on as it is very particular due to the weapon that they use Britain doesn't just stop there, it also becomes involved in China. With the sales of opium, which the Qing, which is where you get the word China from. China, 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 China now. China. Really sorry, just couldn't resist that. The British sold more opium into China, which is the reason for the opium wars in China, which there were two. The British were selling more opium into China for a longer period of time than Escobar was selling cocaine. Estimates suggest that Escobar was selling about a thousand tons of cocaine per year at his height. Britain's imports of opium into China accelerate past 1835 and continue for almost 50 years into the 1880s reaching to levels of 6,500 tonnes a year. These are scenes from 1997 where the British are handing Hong Kong back to China and it was a memorable occasion and many tears were certainly shed. One of the concerns is obviously the fact that this territory was taken as a result of Britain importing opium in such large quantities that the government, the Qing dynasty government, was saying to the British, please stop importing that, it is causing huge problems for our inhabitants, for our citizens. There was a huge drug epidemic. The Qin dynasty was so upset by the opium that they actually destroyed some that came into port. The British government and the British merchants were so upset by this that they declared war and eventually claimed control of Hong Kong. From 1899 to 1902, Britain set up the first concentration camps in South Africa, not necessarily the first in the world, which would go to the Spanish in Cuba, but certainly the first to be involving the entire population of areas. These camps were disgraceful. Meager rations, lack of sanitation, lack of medical supplies, lack of decent facilities. 
meant that over 26,000 women and children were to die inside these camps. One of the most shocking things that I discovered was between 1952 and 1957, the dropping of several nuclear bombs on Australia by British scientists. What became more shocking was that the areas of Maralinga and the Emu fields had inhabitants who weren't informed of the dropping of the nuclear bomb. Have a listen. This black mist rolled through the tops of the trees and along the ground and through the grasses. The information, of course, wasn't passed on to the traditional owners or to the Aboriginal people who were in the area. It was something that they had no knowledge of or, or didn't know how to handle. People started becoming really sick soon after the fallout and that was a lot of family, a lot of Dad's family, a lot of the older generation, our great-grandmothers, our great-grandfathers and the old people who were there at the time. My final choice is Kenya, and it's to link it in with Boris Johnson and his warped interpretation of British history. During an eight year conflict in Kenya, Britain tried to restore order and relocated a group of people called the Kiyukyu. Some accounts suggest it's 80,000, that's British authorities, whereas other historians have suggested somewhere in the region of 160 to even 450,000 were interned. That means imprisoned, moved, kept on reservations or concentration camps. According to some historians, electric shock was widely used as well as cigarettes and fire. Bottles, gun barrels, knives, snakes, vermin and hot eggs were thrust up rectums and women's vaginas. Among the detainees was Hussein Obama, the grandfather of former US President Barack Obama. And according to his widow, British soldiers forced pins into his fingernails and buttocks and squeezed his testicles between metal rods. Two other prisoners were castrated. Yet Boris Johnson, then Mayor, now Prime Minister, thought it was appropriate to say this. Some say it was a snub to Britain. Some say it was a symbol of the part Kenyan president's ancestral dislike of the British Empire. As you can tell, this is quite a checkered and violent and vile history. Yet David Starkey and Nigel Farage ignore this history repeatedly. And one of the most interesting things is what David Starkey had said recently. Let's have a listen to Nigel Farage who recently got David Starkey back on TV after saying some of the worst comments you'll hear on YouTube. You did make a couple of remarks. I won't re-rehearse them, we don't need to. Slavery was not genocide. Otherwise there wouldn't be so many damn blacks in Africa or in Britain, would there? So because some people survive, it's not that big a deal? I mean, this man claims to be a historian. And he comes up with stuff like this and you're just going, right, well, you're clearly bigoted. You've come up with some quirky ideas that make little to no sense. We're talking about millions of people being forced to migrate, being tortured, raped with a bunch of paedophiles involved. And he's going, not that big a deal, really, is it? You know, an awful lot of them survive. Um, and uh, what, it, what, what, again, there's no point in arguing against globalization or Western civilization. They are all products of it. I find this weird because he's a Brexiteer. He seems to support Nigel Farage in his Brexiteering. And yet he's talking about globalization not being a problem for other groups. But it is a problem for a Brexiteer. So what is he? We are all products of it. The honest teaching of the British Empire is to say, quite simply, it is the first key stage of world globalization. It's probably the most important moment in human history, and it is still with us. Its consequences are still on, and generally speaking, in most ways, actually fruitful. And as for the idea, as I said, that slavery is this, this, this kind of terrible disease that dare not speak its name, it only dare not speak its name, Darren, because we settled it nearly 200 years ago. We didn't settle it 200 years ago. That is nonsense. Up until 2015, we were still paying off the slave debts. So it's taken us over 200 years to pay all of this off. And again, Starkey's saying this isn't relevant. That means 
everyone who's alive and was over the age of 16 or earning money from 2015, you were paying off that debt as well. Now, if he's suggesting that it was settled in some way, as in the act was started and now we've just paid off, great, well, let's dissect that. Skin colour, as a form of deciding if that person's a slave or not, is unique to the Atlantic slave trade, which is the beginnings of racism. Now, actually, we can track that back to the Catholic Church and the Spanish Inquisition. And the Spanish Inquisition used skin colour as a way of deciding if you were Catholic or not. I'm unaware of the Ottomans, Rome, Greece having any issue with skin colour. It was whether or not you'd lost a war or you'd been captured in war or you had to pay off some form of debt. It wasn't based on skin colour. That is the unique difference with what took place with the Atlantic slave trade. He then tries to make some sort of comparison with this and Catholicism in Britain. If you need to, you can hide your religious beliefs. You cannot hide your skin colour, David Starkey. Wake up. We don't normally go on about the fact uh, that Roman Catholics, once upon a time, didn't have a vote and weren't allowed to have their own churches because we had Catholic emancipation. And you know what? We had Catholic emancipation at pretty much exactly the same time that we got rid of slavery in the 1830s. So that's then. Let's have a look and see if he's actually got any remorse. Want to make a bet if he does? He did make a couple of remarks that were pretty crass. I think you probably would admit that now. And you have been cancelled. I mean, you were, you lost your uh, university positions. You had, I think, some books um, cancelled. Do you accept that what you said was rather stupid, or was it all part of free speech and open debate? Uh, what I said, uh, come on, please, you clearly haven't been keeping up. I, I apologised at the time. I remember that, um, yes. But there's no point in doing that. What I said was stupid, I used uh, a word, and come on, Nigel, you've never, ever, under any circumstance, no. made a mistake, have you? So he starts off well, and then he flips and goes, oh, you, you never said anything stupid, have you, Nigel? Let's have a listen to the stupid thing that he said. Otherwise, there wouldn't be so many damn blacks in Africa or in Britain, would there? It's not a slip of the tongue. It's what he actually thinks. And you see it over and over again. He does another interview talking about Mary Seacole and so sort of saying, oh, she didn't really do anything with medicine. And it's like, didn't really do any nursing, and it was just for the rich. And you're just, you just wonder what goes on through his head in order for him to do that. And the only thing that you can come to a conclusion of is that he's a racist. And this all seems to come from some sort of indoctrination about the British Empire being great and it has no fault. And I've just shown you a category of only some, I haven't shown you all, some of the messed up stuff that has taken place both before World War II and after World War II. Yet both Starkey and Nigel refuse to acknowledge that history. Can we agree that it's a very good thing that Britain did rule the waves because for 50 years in the 1800s, it was the British Navy that got rid of the slave trade when all the other countries wanted to continue it? It's simply not true what he's saying. Haiti, 1804, Chile, Mexico, Uruguay, Bolivia. But this gets worse as well, because what Nigel is doing is saying that the slave owners were the great people because they decided not to be slave owners anymore and went around releasing all the slaves that they had enslaved. It's a bit, I mean, the equivalency could be that of, and this is extreme, rapists going around, I've raped all these women and now I've let them go, so I'm a good person. There's still more to it. The slaves themselves didn't get any money for all the beatings, all the punishment, all the rape, all the paedophilia that they suffered, didn't get a penny from anyone. And that law of 1833 only released children under the age of five. Everyone else had to still work for another six years to gain freedom. Nigel, as usual, doesn't know what he's talking about, or he's going along with a propaganda line, either left by the British Empire, which he's been indoctrinated in, or he really believes this, or he's just purporting this false ideology, false narrative about a fake history. <laughs> We are the one country in the Western world that fought hard at massive cost in money and lives to get rid of the slave trade. And why don't we celebrate that? 
Because by saying that, Nigel, you're ignoring what I've just shown you prior to this. On top of that, he's also ignoring the fact that those people that were enslaved were also fighting for their freedoms. Like the people of Haiti. Which you ignore by saying stuff like that. And it's almost like you're objectifying them. And that they needed Britain to achieve this. Not after a few of these, no. You, 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 like, you like the people in The Guardian and the BBC always <laughs> observe discretion, complete balance, total impartiality. Absolutely. Nothing ever slips through your lips. Absolutely. Nothing ever slips through your lips. Slips through your lips. Slips from your lips sounds like didn't intend to let out his actual thoughts. Have a listen again. Otherwise, there wouldn't be so many damn blacks in Africa or in Britain, would there? Well, I'm no. afraid it did. Yes. Uh, and it was stupid. And I paid a price. But you know what? I haven't paid all that bad a price. Does this sound like a man with regrets? I was very fortunate. I, thanks to all those years of television, I was prosperous. Yep. The university appointments were merely honorary. And also, you know what? You really do discover who friends are. Um, yeah, I bet. I was, well, I was equally very fortunate. I didn't lose a single person that I valued. You then also discover what titles and honorifics are worth. If they can be taken away for a single word. Otherwise, there wouldn't be so many damn blacks in Africa or in Britain, would there? What is the value of them? They are worthless. What I did, I learned that the people conferring those distinctions have no right to do so. That they represent nothing. If something that's supposedly given to you because you're a distinguished historian is taken away because of a single slip of the tongue. Otherwise, there wouldn't be so many damn blacks in Africa or in Britain, would there? That is not justice. That is not reason. That is not the proper correction of behavior. It is mere crass vengeance. It is a desire. It is also an act of gross ingratitude. That round of applause is just disturbing. David. So it is an act of you have mere been, like ingratitude. You have been one of the biggest victims of cancel culture. But let me ask you one last question. No, no, never the word victim. OK, okay. all right. Do I look broken? No, come you on. don't. Right. You don't. Do I not? But how, do we, but how do we get you back? No, come on. Come on. This is vital. You're only a victim if you behave like a victim, if you're crushed like a victim, if you respect the people who do it. I don't respect them. I treat them with the most absolute yeah. disdain and contempt. Otherwise, there wouldn't be so many damn blacks in Africa or in Britain, would there? They happen to manage so much of our public life. They are not worthy of shining my shoe, and I'm wearing <laughs> suede. Yeah. That is the end. I mean, there was more stuff. I thought this was more than enough for us to sort of dissect and detail through. I've given you a background history, and this is the type of stuff that you get. Not only does he not know his history, or he's choosing to ignore it for his own uh, narrative, he's obviously shown no remorse. He doesn't think he's done anything wrong. He's got this level of arrogance and Frankly, so does Farage. I mean, either they don't know their history or they're deliberately ignoring it and want to achieve their goals. And I don't believe Starkey's got any level of remorse. He, he's, he's just a bigot. And considering he's someone from the gay community that would have been persecuted, you'd think he'd have some level of empathy. And he has none. None. I hope you enjoyed my political observations this week. If you'd like to support me, please share the video with others and post about it on social media. If you're keen for more, subscribe, comment, like, and hit that notification button. Thanks for listening, and see you next time on Political X.